Good evening, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the North Carolina Literary Review's Alex Albright 2021 Award Virtual Reading and 2022 Online Issue Launch Celebration. My name is Erin Guzman, and I'm an editorial assistant with NCLR. Tonight's event is co-hosted by North Carolina Humanities, and I'd like to give huge thank yous to Sherry Paula Watkins, Executive Director of North Carolina Humanities, Melanie Moore Richardson, Develop and Communications Manager of North Carolina Humanities, and Melissa Giblin, Director of North Carolina Center for the Book, who are handling Zoom for us. I'd also like to give many thanks to my NCLR colleagues who have helped with planning and participating in this event. Welcome to our editor, Dr. Margaret Bauer, and our senior associate editor and special guest, Christy Halberg. Also, welcome to the person who this contest is named after, Alex Albright. All of them are watching from their respective screens and send thanks to all of you for tuning in. At this time, I'd like to invite Sherry Paula Watkins to speak. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sherry Paula Watkins and I am the Executive Director of the North Carolina Humanities. Thank you, Erin, and thanks to the North Carolina Literary Review for inviting North Carolina Humanities to co-host tonight's event. We have been fortunate to work with the North Carolina Literary Review this year and in years prior, and I want to expressly thank the editor, Dr. Margaret Bauer, for this partnership. NCLR is such a valuable resource and an outlet for writers here in North Carolina. And we are proud to be able to be part of that tonight. It is fitting that the North Carolina Humanities is here, since tonight we celebrate those who have been part of the Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize Contest. Just last year, we honored Alex with our John Tyler Caldwell Award for the Humanities and for Alex's statewide impact and dedication to creative writing, teaching, and humanities advocacy. And Alex, I'm so glad to see that you were in our audience tonight. So thank you for being here. North Carolina Humanities is currently accepting nominations for the 2022 Caldwell Award. So if you know someone in your life that is committed to the humanities and helps us understand its importance, we invite you to submit their name by April 22. This is a big year for us at North Carolina Humanities as we celebrate our 50th anniversary as the leading nonprofit charged with advancing public access to and support for the humanities across the state. I invite you to visit us online at nchumanities.org to learn more and learn about how you can get involved. Thanks again to NCLR for allowing us to be part of tonight's reading I'm really looking forward to hearing from these amazing authors. Happy reading. Back to you, Erin. Thank you for those words, Sherry Paula. Our reading tonight not only celebrates current and past Alex Albright Award winners and finalists, but also the release of NCLR Online Winter 2022. You can view the issue from our website at nclr.ecu.edu. Click on Issues and then the NCLR Online tab. This issue features an essay by Caroline Rash. You'll hear a part of it tonight, and we know you'll want to finish it. Not to mention, see the gorgeous layout featuring her grandmother's quilts. Hint, hint, you're staring at one of it right here in my background. This issue also includes two of the 2021 Albright Prize honorees essays as well, and lots of book reviews to guide you in reading North Carolina writers please buy from independent bookstores. Tonight, Caroline Rash will be joined by two other readers from NCLR's Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize Contest, whose essays have, have appeared in previous issues of NCLR online. We'll introduce them in a moment. First, some information about this contest, named for NCLR's founding editor, who received the 2021 John Tyler Cal Caldwell Award for the Humanities, North Carolina Humanities' highest honor. To show our excitement for this important recognition of Alex's contributions to North Carolina, NCLR donated copies of our premier 1992 issue, which North Carolina Humanities will send to you for donations made to this important organization 
in Alex Albright's name. The Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize Contest is open to any writer who currently lives in North Carolina, has lived in North Carolina, or uses North Carolina as a subject matter. Writers submit previously unpublished creative nonfiction of up to 7,500 words. Submissions do not have to focus on an issue's special feature theme or even be about North Carolina, as long as the writer has a North Carolina connection. We welcome all forms of creative nonfiction from memoir to travel writing, food writing, essay, and the list goes on. There is no submission fee, but writers must be an NCLR subscriber or a member of the North Carolina Literary and Historical Association to submit. You can subscribe or join after submitting, but by the submission deadline, please. The 2022 prize is now open to submissions and will close on March 1st. For more information, go to our website and click submissions. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Lucas Padu, an NCLR intern, to introduce our first reader. Hello, I'm Lucas. We are fortunate to have virtually here tonight, Angela Belcher Epps whose essay, Sand Hill, A Symphony of Souls, was selected by final judge Randall Keenan as an honorable mention for the 2018 Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize and was published in the NCLR Online 2019. Keenan noted, uh, Keenan noted of this essay, it struck me as distinguished and having something refreshing to say and a refreshing way of telling it. Angela Belcher Epps currently lives in Raleigh and is an active member of the Carolina African American Writers Collective. She is the author of a novel, Salt in the Sugar Bowl, published by Main Street Rag in 2013. Her stories in creative nonfiction have appeared in several journals and magazines, including Obsidian Literature in the African Dysphoria, Ladies Home Journal, Essence Magazine, and Pembroke Magazine. She's a contributor to three anthologies, namely All the Songs We Sing, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Carolina African American Writers Collective, Heart Space, Real Life Stories on Death and Dying, and Gumbo for the Soul, the recipe for literacy in the Black community. She has also published two grant writing manuals as resources for nonprofit organizations. Angela has a BA in English from Ofstra University and an MA from New York University's Creative Writing Program. Please welcome Angela. Thank you so much, Lucas, for that introduction. Thank you, Margaret, for inviting me to read tonight. I'm very, very pleased. And it's wonderful to meet you, albeit virtually, Alex Albright. I'm going to um, read from my essay about Down East North Carolina. And we lost Randall Keenan Keen in, in the recent um, past, and he's the judge who blindly selected my piece. So I just wanted to appreciate the fact that he connected with this su submission about life in down East North Carolina. And I want to honor his literary spirit that lives on. And so now, Sand Hill, A Symphony of Souls. And thank you all so for all the support from the NCLR team and the NC Humanities. To get to Sand Hill, a small community in Plymouth, North Carolina, one crossed two sets of railroad tracks, then traveled nearly a mile down a sandy dirt road. A road so sandy that a road dragger came through at regular intervals to smooth out the grooves and mud holes. This was the only way in or out of Sand Hill. Poor planning left one stranded for 15 or 20 minutes, watching the freight train hiss, hiccup, inch forward and backward, then finally crawl in either direction laden with whatever was required for or distributed by the pulp and paper mill located at the backside of our neighborhood. I lived in Sand Hill for nine years and this community defined my values more than any other life experiences. Sand Hill comprised of no more than three or four dozen houses was a microcosm of a world population. In essence, it was a gathering of individuals rather than a community of demographics. We lived among preachers, teachers, juke joint proprietors, store owners, chicken thieves, factory workers, truants, honor students, gamblers, the elderly, 
petty criminals, the mentally unstable, widows and widowers, introverts, alcoholics, farmers, and adulterers. Sandhill Winters brought brief conversation shouted across the yards that ran one into the next without fences. My grandmother's Willing Workers Club members visited the sick, frail, and elderly. These middle-aged women ventured briskly down the roads and paths armed with palliative pots of stew, warmer blankets, or simply their cheerful demeanors. They bravely crossed the thresholds of ailing neighbors, even those with whom they had next to nothing in common and next to nothing to say. I accompanied the women on such treks and time passed with the speed of water struggling to boil on a tepid burner. Winter evenings were dark, mostly predictable, but still mysterious. No one welcomed knocks after nightfall. The absence of street lights intensified the jolt of adrenaline when unexpected visitors came knocking. Doors were opened hesitantly to the eerie blackness with only low white light bulbs to illuminate, to illuminate the face of a crying woman, a verbose and inebriated friend or cousin, or a neighbor wanting to use the phone to call the ambulance or the law. In all seasons, we children skipped across yards in a world of our own, running, hiding, screaming, swinging, jumping, wrestling, oblivious to the inequalities that, in a different environment, might have set us apart. Some children wore shoes and shirts only when the weather turned cooler, and some pants were held up with safety pins instead of belts, or worse, a child might rely on an incessant hitching up throughout the day because often fit was of no consequence. The point of clothing was simply to cover. In contrast, a preacher's son had far better clothing and way more flesh on his body. His family rode in late model Buicks. Three dainty girls also come to mind, clean, always in socks and shoes, waving and smiling when they, passed, when they passed us in the back seats of their grandparents' cars. No matter the disparities among us, on Sand Hill, there was little judgment and no underlying imperative to improve, to overcome, to reform, to fret. Perhaps it was the era or the collaboration and tolerance that grew out of organic community. At any rate, that locale taught me that the world is comprised of a diverse cast of characters. Some are cut from sprawling yards of lush materials and others from scratchy remnants that might easily be cast aside. Regardless of tendencies and idiosyncrasies, everyone's place on Sand Hill was as warranted and accepted as that of any others. There was no waiting, wishing, or petitioning for the likes of so-and-so to move on. There was no agonizing over two and sometimes three juke joints and liquor houses splattered among us, which meant Friday and Saturday nights all year long brought the sounds of heavy bass reverberating through the night from jukeboxes turned up high. Chevy Impalas, Dodge Coronets, and Chrysler Imperials lumbered and weaved down the pocked roads and spun their wheels in our loamy ditches till dawn. Morning gossip, fresh as air dried sheets, traveled across closed lines about shootings or cuttings or fights from the night before because these juke joints were sites wherein dramas played out. Gambling debts, cheating spouses, the unleashing of frustrations. Still, there was no deepening fear about their proximity to impressionable children. There was a natural order, even in the chaos. Everyone didn't frequent such places. Everything wasn't for everybody. Individuals picked and chose where they went, as well as the games they played. Such was life. Decades later, when I was shoulder deep in research and writing grants in support of programs for underserved communities, I realized that Sand Hill had been an intervention model beyond replication. 
The heterogeneous population ranged from the poor and indigent to the solidly middle class. There was a communal sharing of knowledge, skills, expectations, and often resources that gave all the children a leg up. There were real life role models of all ages and factions for working hard, being resourceful, respecting elders, being a good neighbor, or making do on a pittance. Sandhill became my personal example of resiliency in action because over the years, many success stories emanated from those raised therein. Restaurateurs, store owners, a private detective, a military colonel, nurses, homemakers, a doctor, businessmen and women, a prison chaplain, hardworking citizens, and of course, a writer. Years of living in urban communities have shown me what happens when poor and less fortunate families are all relegated to the same camp, when they call only from the same economic, social, and psychological coffers. I've also seen what happens when more fortunate individuals relish too comfortably in the peace and calm that comes from homogeneous lifestyles. I, like any other adult, desire a certain ease in living, but I challenge myself often not to get too comfortable with the pursuit of parity. I remind myself to see through the eyes of my foundational years, remembering the assortment of individuals who walk the roads of Sand Hill. When I become too judgmental and analytical about how other people should live, I have to reel myself in. I recall that it takes all kinds to make a world and that I am a dot in the big picture, as are all the individuals around me. Together, we create a textured experience that honors humanity. When we are hell bent on designing a blueprint for community, we create a caricature of society. The sand hill in which I grew up helped me trust that the world in all its imperfection is actually a symphony of souls. Thank you so much. Thank you, Angela, for that amazing reading. Thank you. I'd like to remind everybody that you can read her essay in NCLR Online 2019. And if you'd like more information on her work and her upcoming events, you can find Angela's website in the chat. My name is Alyssa Overton and I'm an NCLR editorial assistant. I'd like to proudly introduce our next reader, Faith Holzart, winner of the 2019 Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize. Her winning piece, How I Was Mothered, is an excerpted from her recently completed manuscript titled Millennial, a memoir in essays. Final judge Tony Early chose Holzart's essay for the prize saying, I found myself mesmerized by the writing. It's a remarkable piece of writing about a remarkable confluence of American lives. How I Was Mothered was nominated by our editorial staff for Best of the Net and was selected as a 2020 finalist. Writers, take note. NCLR nominates our prize winners for several honors, including the Pushcart Prize. Faith Holsart is an educator, activist, and writer. She's been publishing fiction since the 1980s and has begun to publish poetry as well. She's the co-editor of Hands on the Freedom Plow, Personal Accounts by Women in SNCC. She's also published two poetry chapbooks, Year Forever in My Veins from Backbone Press and Falls Lake, Swimming in History from Finishing Line Press. Faith earned her MFA from Warren Wilson College in Shawananoa, North Carolina, and she presently lives in Durham, North Carolina with her partner, Vicki Smith. Welcome, Faith. Hello. Oh, okay. Can can people hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, well, I like following Angela, first of all, because her piece was so beautiful, but also because my memoir really is based on the idea that how I was mothered um, gave birth to the person I became. became. Sorry. Um, so this is from the winning essay, which is the very beginning. And I'm introducing myself and my parents. I'm a baby. <laughs> my mother, Eunice, says her mother wouldn't feed her 
eggs or butter or chocolate because Grandma Spellman did not want my mother to be sallow, code for dark and therefore not American enough. To the end of her life, my mother scours her dusty skin with Dr. Palmer's almond meal, which comes in a tin. Her skin looks peeled and glassy when she is done, but not paler. My mother says the photographer tossed the tool at her at the last moment because she would not lie smiling and naked on her belly on the wall skin. She was to be the center cameo in the framed photos. Her brother Howard, who would molest my mother, her sister Tony, who would commit suicide, her brother Bob, who would give her a massive collie dog one in a card game. My mother says she refused to lie naked on the rug. She says they all were exasperated. In the sepia photo, her lip has only just stopped trembling and the tears would still be on her cheek if someone had not wiped them away. She clutches the tool draped around her shoulders. My mother says in the vast apartment near Riverside Drive, <clears throat> it was echoing and lonely, often just she, the fourth and much younger child and the Irish women who worked there. Sometimes she went to mass with these women. She made a red cross for herself out of sealing wax, which enraged her mother. I imagine the Irish women as teenagers, not that much older than my five or six-year-old mother. My mother says her father drank because her mother was so terrible. In how many stories is there a bad mother? That every morning there was an empty bottle in his trash in the bedroom. How did she know? Youngest, alone, rambling the apartment, dead set against the mother who couldn't nourish her, the mother who believed the older blue-eyed brother. My mother says her brother Howard, the Yaley, in the days when Yale had such a strict Jewish quota that my grandfather applied for Howard's enrollment on the day of Howard's birth. This Howard, who did the un-Jewish but very American thing of fighting in World War I, the Navy forever on my grandparents' armoire in black and white under glass in his pale uniform. That Howard tried to molest her, she says. Something about his trying to catch her in a corridor in that vast apartment. She never says, but I am sure she never told her parents. She says he tried as if he didn't succeed. But I know in her lifelong terrors, her lifelong valor of a little dog throwing itself at the churning tires of a moving truck. No, in her anxiety, no, in her marvelous and imprisoning marginality, that he, 10 years older than the dark and fierce five-year-old, he succeeded. And the merciful brother, Bob, saw or guessed, or maybe she told him. And Bobby won the massive mahogany and cream collie in a card game and brought it home to his little sister and said, Buddy sleeps in your room every night, every single night. I am ready. My eyes are big with astonishment at this place I have found myself so recently seized from the womb while my mother was adrift in ether. My mother's dark hands in the black and white photo are almost as big as I am. Our bone and sinew speaking already of exhaustion. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my place. Because of her cause, 
My mother wears a paper mask to protect me. Nearby, a tiny glass bottle with a rubber nipple. In 1943, they thought this was best for a newborn. Maybe the ether, the mask, the glass bottle, and my mother's startled near black eyes were the only ways they knew to usher us in, breathe the same air as, nourish and protect themselves against their love for my new life, which came from another place. The neat folds in the white organdy dress are from the store box, a crisp grid down to my baby feet. I am less than a week old. My dark eyes are open to this world and the fingers of one hand pluck at the organdy, the dress bought by my red-headed aunt, my father's older sister, who calls my mother the Jewess. I gaze upon a world that I have no reason to fear. Well, not quite the case as I have made the birth journey in a World War II hospital named Misericordia in the Bronx, territory unknown to my Manhattan parents, Misericordia, a Catholic hospital where my parents fear if a choice must be made, the baby would be saved at the expense of the mother's life. During the birth, my mother was knocked out by ether that straightened her wavy black hair for the rest of her life severed the conscious connection between myself in her dark insides and her, my mother who had carried me for nine months. The ether would have affected the flow of oxygen into my being as well before I was yanked from her womb and down the birth canal. Five pounds, three ounces, baby of a cigarette smoking mother. On that day, Resting on my silken pillow, resplendent in white, I am perfect. My parents jewel in her organdy dress with the department store folds, the little feet peeping from under the hem. I am perfect. I am perfectly alone. My mother holds me, her shoulders tense and high. She wears a pleated mask over her mouth. We cannot see her mouth. She feeds me from the small glass bottle, her dark hand large, almost the length of myself. She rests me in a receiving blanket on my father's lap. His hand resting lightly on my chest is even bigger than hers. The red and cream cocker spaniel watches with dark eyes. My cloth diaper which my mother is still awkward in pinning into place, is wet. My mouth is a rosebud. My parents will panic when it crumples into a cry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Faith, for that exceptional reading. My name is Rachel Brown and I am an intern with NCLR. If you'd like to read Faith's piece, I remind everyone you can read the full essay in NCLR Online 2020. Next up, we have a finalist from our 2021 Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize. Her essay is featured in our NCLR Online Winter 2022 issue, just released February 1st. Within her essay, Layout in the Issue, you will find several quilts featured, one which I have displayed um, as my background. Um, they were created by the writer's grandmother, Sue Holder Rash of Boiling Spring, North Carolina. Caroline Rash is a multi-genre writer who grew up in North Carolina. Her poetry has been published in Connotation Press and she has an essay in Decider. She currently teaches high school English. She earned her BA in English Language and Literature from Clemson University and her MFA in Poetry from Rutgers University. Here to read an excerpt of her essay, Love and Mushrooms and Zooms in the Ruins, Please welcome Caroline Rash. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Rachel. Um, let me make sure I thank everyone who had a part in this. I, it's such an honor to be here. Thank you, Margaret, for your great edits on the piece. Thank you, Aaron, for your clear communication throughout this process. Uh, thank you, Rachel, Lucas, Alyssa, Amrina, 
and it's an honor to read with um, Angela and Faith. Um, I look forward to reading more of your work. And it's nice to meet you virtually, Alex. Alex Albright. I'm having flashbacks right now to teaching last year through Zoom. Um, no, but I, I love that we're able to connect across the geographical distance. I've enjoyed going to readings on Zoom. So um, thank you, everyone. This is part of Love and Mushrooms and Zooms in the Ruins. Rumor has it the first living thing to emerge from Hiroshima's blasted landscape was a Matsutake mushroom. It was mid-March, remember? The New Year's Eve champagne bubbles had long burst. I had just transitioned my ninth grade English class to online learning. No more 5.30 a.m. alarms, but rather long hours staring at a computer screen interspersed with terrifying transmissions from the White House Rose Garden. At first, we all had hope. On my laptop, I still have a folder labeled two week online lesson plans for coronavirus. In this strange space, I began reading about Matsutake mushrooms, an offhand recommendation from a friend. I ordered the mushroom at the end of the world on the possibility of life in capitalist ruins, a nearly 300 page volume that offers, quote, what a rare mushroom can teach us about sustaining life on a fragile planet. It's a great book, by the way, I highly recommend it. I was curled up in bed with another headache because I hadn't yet realized that I could adjust the blue light settings on my computer screens. Australia was still burning. My grandmother, a normally healthy Scottish dancer, had just broken her femur in a freak accident. Okay, I thought, tell me about mushrooms, those rebellious forest dwellers. Tell me how to live. By April, it was clear to everyone that back to normal is not a place that we could go that the virus will not suddenly vanish. It tears through bustling urban centers first. Singh notes that the logic of expansion, such as that of industrial forest, flourishing into thicker and denser thickets can be in reality, a step towards destruction. Those happy pines and ponderosas that finally have their day in post-millennium Oregon will seed and sprout, seed and sprout, seed and sprout, until they're thick enough that just one ember can send the whole forest up in flames. Indeed, the streets of New York City and Seattle resemble burned through empty forest. What we see of the mushroom above ground is only the small fruiting of a vast underground organism. Beneath the soil, thread-like filaments called hyphae fan out into wide nets that connect and nourish parts of the forest that we see, such as trees. I begin to think of myself as a mushroom. All my myriad connections and threads have come into relief with the concept of contact tracing. Who of us before truly understood how connected we all are? Now touch is frightening. Our physical threads and pathways must sever. Still through the filament, the wires and electrical signals connecting us comes news. A student's mother dies. My friend, a performing artist, loses all his gigs for the next six months, the next year. My neighbor buries her husband alone. What is time? It lurches and bucks, then sits across from us and wins an endless staring contest. Time has always been deep and uncontrollable, a pit across which we build rickety rope bridges from day to day, week to week, year to year. The ropes fray and break. Time becomes one more walk with my dog, one more glass of water, two more zucchinis in the garden, three more red tomatoes, trash and recycling on Thursday, the slow filling of a green watering can. I leave it that first day in the sink because I'm human and I just can't stand to be still for even one minute and it overflows onto the counter and onto the floor. My friend Sarah tells me she's reading a book of Buddhist lectures by Pema Chodron called When Things Fall Apart. One of the very first pages says, things become very clear when there's nowhere to escape. 
I feel like Narcissus staring into the Zoom screen during empty office hours, waiting for the occasional unpredictable pop-up of a student's name. Do you need help with the classwork, I ask? No, they always stay. I just wanted to talk to someone. I plan an ill-advised visit across five states to see my grandmother. By the way, I'm in New Jersey right now, but I'm representing Boiling Springs, North Carolina. <laughs> When she, was he um, when she was healed from the broken leg, her car was sideswiped while she sat buckled tightly in the passenger seat. Singh pushes back against the selfish gene paradigm popularized by Richard Dawkins that focuses on autonomous units, be they genes, human workers, or even a single species. In fact, Singh explains, some species only develop necessary traits through relationships and encounters with other species. In this vein, the Matsutake mushroom is notoriously impossible to cultivate in captivity, plantation style, as standardized units, by the many interested parties who would love to turn a profit from this Japanese delicacy. The mushrooms are finicky, almost shy, peeping out of the wasteland, inseparable from their symbiotic relationship with certain trees, mostly pines, slowly nourishing and rebuilding with all the living things around them. I'm driving, time becomes border signs, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, Virginia again, and on back up. We measure the way by four hours on, four hours off, the time it takes to drink a 20 ounce gas station coffee miles per tank of gas, the length of a podcast. My grandmother is too weak to teach me her art of quilting like last time, but I tuck a blanket around her and go back to her childhood, a time and place of two room schoolhouses in lower Appalachia before power lines sprouted one by one up the mountain and connected her to the rest of the world. The time it took her to run from her parents' home to the schoolhouse even before she was old enough to matriculate, the missing minutes of her naps on the older students' coats, the number of books she could read between each rumble of the mobile library bus. I start to adapt. Whereas before I would leave the house before dawn, work indoors until 3.35 PM, return home, maybe drive to the gym, cook dinner, prepare for the next day over and over and over. I now sleep until the sun floods my bedroom. I have coffee sitting down, stand on the porch in my pajamas to feel the day's temperature. Yes, like everyone else, I'm afraid to go grocery shopping, afraid for my students with unstable homes, afraid for my grandmother, afraid for my friends who suddenly have lost all income. Chodron describes entering this fear as a complete undoing of the old ways of seeing hearing, smelling, tasting, and thinking. Without the hundred distractions that normally eat into my class time, I finally fi I find an entirely new reading of a Rita Dove poem we're studying. Oh my God, I breathe into the computer microphone. This narrator might be performing a cover-up of childhood abuse. Look at these images, how ambiguous. They could actually be good or bad. A few years ago, the first time I read this poem, it seemed like a simple childhood memory, but the windows are dark now and I'm alone, reading slowly, recording. I sit with the poem and it opens to me suddenly without preamble. My students will hear their teacher overcome by these words when they log in in the morning. You're a good teacher, my boyfriend says when I'm done. He overheard the part about the poem but this isn't the teacher I was in February. And my students aren't the same students either. Some drop off the grid the day that we dismiss in-person classes. I and a team of social workers and counselors will spend the next few months trying to find them. Others released from the eye-rubbing dark dawn bus rides, rigid bell schedules, ceaseless assessments, finally hit their stride. Every mushroom pushes through the earth at a different time, in a different soil, with a different tree. Some might not fruit above ground for 40 or 50 years. 
The pain from her wreck has made my grandmother quiet. They refuse to give her more pain medication because of the opioid epidemic. The Sackler family and their pharmaceutical associates wrote a script for America, mostly rural working class people that said, you don't have to feel anything anymore. My grandmother asked me to help her get to the bed. We go into her dim bedroom in the back of the house. I get her cotton pajamas laid out and help her undress. She's never needed help before. It was always her helping me. I rub some type of icy hot pain reliever across her skin and time becomes each dip of my fingers into the jar. Minutes of spreading cool lotion on her back, hips, knees, and ankles. She turns on the little TV at the foot of the bed and I tuck her in like she tucked me in decades before. I hope she'll be able to sleep tonight. Last night, she measured time by creaking trips to the restroom, diminishing minutes of unconsciousness, any little bit she could steal. I'm gonna skip a little bit more, make sure I'm on track. Across the sea in Japan, another ritual of tending the earth becomes popular. Satoyama forest restoration is an initiative based on the Japanese concept of Satoyama, a type of landscape that includes both human production and natural habitats, notably in which human influence is an essential aspect. Singh notes that in this type of landscape, in this kind of tending, it actually requires humans to, quote, make a mess allow for erosion and other seemingly negative qualities in order to advantage the pines. At first it looks bad and erupted, but the trees will come and then the Matsutake. We can't cultivate it neatly. We can't make a factory farm of it, but if we make a mess, it will come. I find myself waiting with the watering can, watching it fill. I sit on the porch and talk to my neighbors, a family over the fence. I tell the mother at the last minute we are leaving for my grandmother's house. We'll be gone for over a week and I worry about my garden. I'll take care of it, don't worry, she says. In fact, I forget the car garden. I don't worry about it one bit. Driving in the darkness through Virginia's deciduous forest makes me feel even more groundless if it were possible. I'm worried about so many things about the plans for school reopening, everything. Every single decision comes with an asterisk, subject to change. I try to just drive, just sit with my thoughts, but there seem to be more wrecks this time than ever before. An awful tangle of metal, a full 16 wheeler tipped over in the grassy ditch. I don't want to die. I've started crying. I need to pull over like when the rain's too much for my windshield wipers. I don't want my grandmother or my students or their grandmothers or my friends or anyone else to ever die. I'm throwing a fit. Joe drives until a sign for the red roof, until we see a sign for the red roof in. He takes the exit. There's a plan for reopening my school. Every school at this point has a plan. Everyone is running about fretting and demanding and providing expert opinions. What if we paused just for a minute as our watering cans fill? What if we grieved? My grandmother has been a widow many decades longer than she was ever married. That wasn't the plan. She fills her days with a very specific kind of meditation, stitching quilt after quilt, beautiful works of art. She gave me a wall hanging years ago with an image of a woman pulling water from a well. Is there a plan? If there's a plan, I hold it lightly. I saw a set of three mushrooms on my walk yesterday. They delighted me. Today they are gone, though the broad net of organisms still must live beneath the soil, still lunches with the nearby trees. I call my grandmother. The pain is abating some. She went to this doctor and that, and someone along the way did something right. I promise I'll be back as soon as this mess is all over. School begins. I'm anxious as always because there's no way to get it all right. 
you clear cut the broadleafs, the pines shoot up, you privilege the ponderosas, the mushrooms never arrive. There's no calculation of all possible outcomes. I'll do my best with my human understanding. I take comfort that learning is something akin to delight, indeterminate, both slow gathering and sudden bloom. The rocking of two chairs on a porch, the fruit of a tossed out seed, the pause on a long walk home. I rub my grandmother's bruised and broken legs and remember how they carried her flying across the field towards a two room schoolhouse. I ask her to tell me the story again. What if we took this moment to truly attend to our world? My neighbor, still a stranger really, promised she would care for my garden. The night we return in our road tired rush to unpack and go to sleep, I forget to check it. That night, I dream of the hot afternoon I took a shovel to the earth and turned it inside out, rows upon rows of it, a total mess. The next morning, I wake up and go out. One of my squash plants is dead. Some kind of bug I'll have to read about and fight next summer. But the rest are in full bloom. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful reading, Caroline. I loved it. <laughs> um, my name is Amrita Rangar, and I'm an intern with NCLR. Uh, first, I want to remind you that you can read Caroline's whole essay in NCLR Online's Winter 2022 issue. And if you want to read any of her other works, you can find them linked on her website. I also want to give a huge thank you to all the readers that we've listened to tonight. And if you're feeling inspired to submit, the 2022 Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize is now open to submissions and will close on March 1st. Also, we'll send anywhere, anyone here tonight who subscribes and or submits to NCLR over this weekend a copy of the 2016 print issue, which features the first ever winner of the Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize. Uh, before we move on to a Q&A that will give us all an opportunity to ask these amazing writers about crafting their essays, I'm here to introduce a special guest with us tonight, also featured in NCLR Online's Winter 2022 issue. Not only is the, she the senior associate editor for NCLR, a teaching professor of English at East Carolina University, an author of many creative nonfiction essays, book reviews, short stories, and interviews, but I'm also proud to call her the best mentor I've ever had. Professor Christy Hallberg, author of the newly released novel, Searching for Jimmy Page, we are thrilled that you could join us tonight. You can read an interview with her in the winter issue. Searching for Jamie Page is Professor Hallberg's first book, and though it is a work of fiction, there are heavy influences in the story from her own life experiences growing up in Greenville, North Carolina. So welcome, Professor Hallberg. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your process in terms of intricately weaving creative nonfiction with a work of fiction? What were some of the personal experiences that you were inspired by, and how were you able to incorporate them into your story? Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for that introduction. And it is such a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you, Margaret, North Carolina Humanities, NCLR, Alex, um, the amazing readers that we've just had the pleasure of listening to, Angela Faith and Caroline and, and Marina, thank you so much. Um, yeah, that there is a lot of of nonfiction that found its way into my novel, as Margaret well knows, having read all of it in draft form, chapter by chapter, um, from, it started out as a memoir, actually. So that was the beginning of it. Um, and I, I went to all of the locations that are featured in the book uh, during four, four different pilgrimages to England to, to really deal with um, grief over losing my mother and then grief over losing my husband. And, and then just making sure I got the details of the novel correct. But as I say, it did start out as a memoir. And so there, there's a lot of um, that personal element that's involved in this novel. Um, the premise of it is set primarily in 1988, Searching for Jimmy Page follows 18-year-old Luna Kane from her family's farm in Eastern North Carolina, where I grew up, um, to the UK to solve the mystery that her free-spirited mother, Claudia, set in motion when Luna was a child, is Jimmy Page, the legendary guitar guitarist from Led Zeppelin, her father. So that's the premise. Um, 
the novel, well, the band was such an integral part of my own growing up because I'm the youngest of four. And the next to the youngest, my brother Steve was a drummer in various rock groups around town in Greenville, North Carolina. And he idolized the band's drummer, John Bonham. So that's how I got into the group. And my mother was um, this very sort of stoic, traditional Southern woman, but she really encouraged our, our passions, her children's passions. And I remember coming home from church and uh, my brother Steve was watching the song Remains the Same, the Led Zeppelin concert movie on MTV. And this would have been in 1985, I guess. And my mother sat and watched it with us and recognized this growing passion that I, I had and helped me hang Led Zeppelin posters in my bedroom, uh, on the walls of my bedroom. And when Jimmy Page, the guitarist for Led Zeppelin, put out his solo album in 1988, and this is featured in the novel, he did a two hour rock line special. You could call in and, and ask him questions. And I was so excited about this and spent the first hour on my little rotary phone dialing and not getting anywhere and, and getting increasingly agitated. And finally, she said, just take a break and, and I'll dial. So there's just all of this intersection between um, my own personal history and the story in the novel. And then even more so is the, the character of the great grandfather, Jesse Baker, is based on and named after my own great grandfather, Jesse Baker, who took a correspondence class on faith healing and, and tried to cure his wife of breast cancer. Um, and that actually plays out in the novel. So there are various characters, there are various scenarios all of these different aspects of my own personal life, my own personal journey um, that, that mirrors what goes on in the novel. So um, I, I, I write a lot of creative nonfiction and have enormous respect for the work of the writers here tonight that I, I'm privileged to have read and, and to have gotten to hear. Um, so, but that, that overlap definitely appears in my own fiction. So, so yeah, thanks for that question, Anne Marina. Thank you, Christy. Um, at this time, we will open up the floor for questions. If you'd like to pose a question to our authors, our editor, or about submitting to NCLR or anything NCLR related, kindly place those questions in the chat box. Um, also, at this time, I'd like to invite all of our readers, um, our special guests, as well as our editor to turn on their uh, cameras and mics so that our guests can feel welcome, our invitees can feel welcome. While people are thinking of questions, I thought I'd pop in and... and um point out that uh, thank you all myself. I'm Margaret Bauer, I'm the editor. And um, thanks Alex for coming and for, this is another one of those love my job days. And I owe so much of that to Alex for uh, turning over uh, NCLR to me 25 years ago. Um, and uh, I'm working on my 25th print issue, 25th year of doing this. So I really appreciate all of you. And I love meeting you kind of face to face, if not in person. Um, fi finally, you're, you know, your name's on the screens, we get to know each other, and then suddenly there you are. Um, thanks to Christy, who uh, volunteers her time as my right hand. And uh, Christy reads everything in the issue before it's accepted. Uh, but, while after it's accepted several times before it goes to the printer she she's just uh, and all of that she does voluntarily so yay christy thank you so much oh it's an honor it's such an honor to be a part of this so, so angela uh, what what's left it at uh the hill what's there now angela you're muted I'm so sorry. It's supposed to be um, the same as it always was, but it has gone down. 
It's uh, really suffering from, I think, the you know, economic conditions of a lot of the down east communities. So the tar paper's peeling, the paint's gone, the porches are rotting. Um, and a lot of the, uh, the juke joints and the liquor houses have just collapsed. Basically, it's rotting wood, you know, uh, surrounded by underbrush and overgrowth. I still have two lots there, actually. So I have an investment in, you know, just keeping Sand Hill alive. I don't know. Who what will happen to us? Yeah, there for all of us, that was really, really impressive. I, I, I was, yeah. For a Thank place that, yeah, we've never heard of, but sort of at the end of it felt like we'd been there with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Um, that actually brings me to a question that I had. Um, it seems as though, yes, it's supposed to you, Angela. Um, so it seems as though Sand Hill is like this symbol of power, culture, and identity. So how has those perspective of uh, those perspectives of Sand Hill influenced your writing or your life as a writer? It has always, I mean, and I started writing really um, sort of as a child because it was just in me to tell stories to, that's how I made meaning from the world. And all those characters were just part of what I saw as the world. Um, the people who fell in the ditches, the people who you know helped other people, uh, the children all coming together in the yard. I thought the world was more like that, you know, when I became a part of the broader community. So those stories are the characters that live in me almost as a symbol of what the world is. It defines the world for me. It makes it very easy for me to accept the kinds of things that are very troubling for other people. Um, staying grounded in a frantic world is sort of my MO. And Sand Hill, because it has such chaos and yet it had such stability, showed me that that's the way of the world. It's not that we're ever going to get to a place where all is well and everybody's you know, getting along and everybody's happy. No, that's not reality. That's, um, that's a pipe dream. And we don't live in a pipe dream. We live among flawed individuals with you know, all kinds of resources and lack of resources. And it gives me peace. And I have so much fun writing about that. And I write a lot of characters who start out really low and find the strength to become stronger and navigate their world in a better way. A mouthful, I know, I'm, I'm a little chatty. No, thank you for that. Thank you. That that was such a great answer. You know, you were talking and I'm just like, wow, this is everything's making sense and I could relate in so many ways. So thank you for that. Thank you. Great. Any other questions at this time and questions are open to the public or and as well as to our readers, you know, you guys can feel free to question each other as well. Well, I would like to ask a question about those lovely quilts because I also sew and, you know, that's part of, I think, the heritage of grandmothers growing up in particular communities. Um, and I just wanted to hear Caroline talk about that as a tradition in her family and if that's something that's carried down to her. Yeah, absolutely. Th um, thank you for asking about that, Angela. It's um, something that I really took for granted growing up or I didn't really pay attention to it you know when I was younger um, both my grandparents I mean both my grandmothers were quilters and um, their mo mothers were quilters but more of from a practical necessity right mm -hmm. so I don't think my grandmother even saw it as like an art form necessarily at first um but now it I think it's morphed into that more for her I mean she has an entire room in her house just stacked to the ceiling with quilts that she, she's just made and sh then she gives them as gifts to everyone um and at some point in my late 20s I realized that it was gonna the art was gonna die out if no one learned it right mm -hmm. um so I've been trying to when I go home and visit uh learn from her and she gave me a sewing machine and so 
you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to learn. Yeah. That's great. That's really cool. Um, it reminds me of um, my aunt, my mom's sister. She sews so well. Um, actually, like I have about 20 masks from her that she sewed. And like I have them in different colors, different patterns. She also sews quilts like and like it's just amazing. And when me and my cousins were younger, every summer she would take us in and like have like these quote unquote summer uh, sewing workshops or su summer sewing sessions with us. In our heads, we didn't realize that she was just like technically babysitting us. Like we always thought it was fun and she was teaching us how to sew. I, I can't do it right. I, I didn't pick up the trade, but some of my cousins did. So I think that's really cool. Yeah, it's like cooking these pieces of our heritage that we like really need to not have not let die out basically. It's true. I and I just you know, to sort of extend that a little bit. I think so often of writing is sort of placekeeping um, because things do change so quickly and you can't throw out everything, you know, you welcome the new, but you also hold on to the things that, you know, make us solid and that cooking and that sewing and, you know, that gardening, you mentioned gardening as well. Those are all arts that have to be sustained if we're to be healthy. I believe, it's just my opinion, but I, I do believe there's a health in that. Absolutely. Being connected to the earth. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. In that quilting, kind of in the thought of quilting, but thinking of it metaphorically, Faith, you, you, I think you called your, uh, you finished the manuscript now and you called it kind of a, a, a memoir in essays. And it, that's kind of a quilting. Um, yeah. Can you talk about the structure of your manuscript now? I know that when we um, accepted the, 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 uh, the essay, you had said it was part of a big project and now you've finished the project. True, for the moment, right? <laughs> um, I guess I had to write the, the piece because it's just, there's so much, you know, side by side in my life and I've lived a while. But at one point I was trying to speak with someone about how I structured it. And I said, you know, sometimes you, you have these, these strands at your feet and you can just weave them into a narrative because, you know, you have three ropes and they're intact, et cetera. But then you also have the times when you don't really, you know, the pieces are in different places and they're different colors. And it's the fact that they're next to one another that brings meaning. And then sometimes you don't even have a line. You just have pebbles with different colors or whatever. Um, and that was me, a fiction writer trying to figure out a new form. And I think one of the characteristics of this age right now um, is that, that we're making free with forms and that that's really wonderful, like the weaving of the mushrooms and human communities and devastation um, and survival and regrowth. Um, but really the impetus for the piece was that I have a very beloved, interesting daughter who's now in her 50s, who's homeless and has a very serious mental illness um, in California. And I'm trying to, and I had a very unusual childhood. I was raised by two mothers, one of whom was African-American and not a maid or a nanny. She was a music teacher. Um, so trying to think about my beginnings and what the practice of motherhood for me in my late in my 70s has been one of um, mothering someone who has a very difficult life. Okay, so I, I wrote those two things and I had a book, a short book. When I sent it out to a couple of presses, it was the summer of George Floyd um, and the SNCC that the person, lovely person who introduced me um, mentioned 
is SNCC, which was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was a, the most militant, the most youthful of the civil rights organizations, and I worked with them. So people were saying, oh, well, we want to know about SNCC. We, the mother stuff is fine. So then I had to think about how I ended up thinking that that the activism, and I did write another 100 pages or so about that, was an outcrop. I grew up in Manhattan where outcrop, the rocks outcrop in the, they just come up from below the surface. Um, and that the activism was that, an outcrop of my childhood. Um, and that, that in many ways, my activism, which included West Virginia and Black Lung Movement, et cetera, that that then informed my mothering of my young children and then later of my adult daughter. Um, and I don't know if that answers your question at all, Margaret, um, but that's, that's how I ended up thinking of things as unfolding from my Sand Hill as opposed to um, the one in North Carolina. My Sand Hill was Greenwich Village. Um, so. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you a lot for um, answering that question from Dr. Bauer, um, Faith. And actually, it, you basically answered another question posed by um, Amrina. She had asked, what led for you to write your story? And was there any one event or one moment that inspired you to write your piece? So you basically answered both questions. So right. thank you very much for that. I would say that, that motherhood as I'm practicing it now, and I'm all going on 80, um, is in so many ways unthinkable and unbearable and awful. But it's not because it's me and I'm a person and it's Carmela and she's a person and I have a son who's also a person. So I think that's another dynamic of how do you tame this awfulness? Um, and all these other things, of course, are going on all around us all the time, including George Floyd. But um, we're not a very kind culture individual cultures are. Sand Hill might be, Greenwich Village might have been, but anyway. Thank you. Anyone else would like to ask any questions? The floor is open. Since I'm chatty, I'll say one more thing. Um, Lionel, um, if actually grew up on Sand Hill is in the audience. And he noted that the iconic Sandy roads are now paved and that's in Sand Hill. And um, yes, they are. And I just wanted to sort of leave a positive note about Sand Hill, because even though there is, you know, um, you know there are challenges and I think a lot of small, small rural towns, but people therein are often some of the most enterprising people that you'll ever find. And when I go through Sand Hill now, even though some of the houses you know, have been abandoned because people left the community or whatever, there are lots of thriving um, individuals there that are incorporating, you know, like we were talking about that um, older culture with the newer aspects of society. And there is something I think heartening about that when there isn't so much change that um, you don't recognize a place. There is enough of that stability there to see that people kind of thrive and have that sort of bootstrap um, experience, even when things are challenging, that makes it still very inspiring for me. And you know, when I ride through, I get, regardless of what it looks like, you know, the positives and the negatives, it's still empowering when you see things survive. And yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to say. Right. Can I ask Carolina? Can I ask Carolina a question? Um, sure, go right ahead. Yeah, um, I, it's a little academic, and uh, forgive me, but I was curious. She has an MFA in poetry, and uh, we, I didn't get. I taught creative nonfiction at ECU and didn't get to hang out with poets in a classroom very often, but it occasionally happened in a, a, a class in research I taught, and I was 
uh, amazed at the uh, how how terrific poets wound up being at creative nonfiction when they uh, recognized the the power of a segmented essay, much like that quilt. And your piece was was like a, a textbook of such a, a thing. And it was so beautifully constructed in the in, in in the way that Faith was talking about individual pieces being put beside of another, and uh, the way it in some ways it was it was jumpy, but it connected, and so it was just really well done. My question was, I wondered if at Rutgers, if you're in, in your studies, if they uh, talked about creative nonfiction. I found at ECU uh, that sometimes poets, uh, and I'm talking here to some other students who might be in the audience, felt like poetry was a little more. Uh, a higher art than creative nonfiction, which was more reportage. And uh, I think that what all of our writers showed tonight is the art that is behind what creative nonfiction yes. can do. But it's really, really good. And so anyway, back to my question to you, Caroline, was it talked about it at Rutgers in your MFA? Uh, yes, and thank you. Um, it, it was, and I I didn't take a class specifically on creative nonfiction, but my actual, my my two best friends in the program were there for creative nonfiction. And for some reason, the creative nonfiction people and the poets just had a good vibe together. I, sure, I yeah. You know, I don't know what it is. Um, I mean, a lot of it is kind of have, or hopefully like building an intuition for like juxtaposition and repetition and how um, things that are different, like Faith said, placed next to each other can enhance both of their meaning. Like you said, yeah. But um, yeah, I, I think they have a lot in common. All right, thank you, Caroline. Um, we actually have a question from the audience. So Enid posts, uh, posed this question to you, Angela. It says, do you relate better to others who have had a Sandhill experience? No, I, I can say I don't. I think the Sandhill experience, because it was so, um, diverse in character helped me relate better to all people. Um, so wherever I go, because I spent more time in the North than in the South, and the, I was just more open to whatever was presented and whomever is presented wherever I go. That's a great question, but yeah, made me a global citizen. Awesome, that's great. I like I like that you said um, it makes you a global citizen. That kind of reminds me of um, technical and professional communication. Just to you know talk about myself a little bit. That's my major, and um, I always say I think that technical and professional communication is knowing how to effectively communicate with your audience. Like think of how you talk to the CEO versus the janitor, or your professor versus your friend. All right. Are there I will add, y'all, uh, there is nothing in our rules that say you can't submit to the Albright contest every year. So I do hope that all of our readers tonight uh, will submit. We are um, accepting now through March 1st. So, and I know that Aaron was going to say that, but I want to make sure you know that um, you can submit again and uh, we would love to read your work again. And also, your poetry in um, March 15th, I think we'll start accepting submissions for poetry for the James Applewhite Poetry Prize. All right. I actually have a question um, kind of for the panel. Um, Faith, so you mentioned that creative nonfiction isn't really your genre. Um, and I'm wondering to all of our readers tonight, what is it about like your topic that you wrote about that was better suited for free of nonfiction as opposed to say fiction or poetry? Um, can I start real quick? Awesome. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. I always think that about whenever I come to the page because I do write, I'm writing a novel right now in poetry and nonfiction. But for me, honestly, <laughs> this piece about COVID and my grandmother and every just, it felt like it, it, was, it, it was almost a journaling experience. Like it was something I needed to work through with a lot of text. I needed to write through a lot. And also I was pulling quotes from three different books that I was reading at the same time. So of course in a, in a poem, you're not gonna 
typically like do a pull quote, right? So <laughs> to me, it seemed natural that it would be um, just a, a creative piece of creative nonfiction because I was quoting, but also I needed to work through a lot of stuff. We, we all did, right? <laughs> Still do. Yeah, it was, it was really well done. I was very impressed. <laughs> what about our other? Well, I chose, um, I choose creative nonfiction when I'm dealing with a philosophical um, way of looking at the world that I want others to connect with. Um, that need, I have a real need for all people to be sort of seen as they are, um, that your people are should be authentic they shouldn't be putting on a show they shouldn't be um trying to impress i think everybody is strongest if they can come as they truly are you know bring your best self forward from wherever you are so creative nonfiction allows me to sort of highlight aspects of culture and community that show sort of every person at their best um not elevating or anything but that's what makes creative nonfiction for me, um, a philosophical need to um, show people, real people. I wrote fiction for most of my life, starting when I was a child. Novels were very admired in my growing up family. Um, I think I thought poets knew so much more than I did that I couldn't write poetry, although I have begun to write po and even publish some poetry. Um, but I think I felt with this story in particular, well, let me back up and say that sometimes the artifice of writing a novel, and I like long stories, long pieces, but I, I found the artifice too much in thinking about the story. Um, both of my mothers who raised me were remarkable people and it would have taken a lot of work, unnecessary work is what I ended up feeling to create par a parallel universe. And because in the 1940s, one was African-American and one was Jewish, anybody who had been part of my world or even in general circles would have known who everybody is anyway. Um, so it just seemed easier. It seemed more honorable in terms of um, when I move into my activist years to be able to name people and the work that they did. People who nobody knows their names, the unnamed people to be able to name them. Um, and it just, it felt very natural. I don't know that I'd do it again. Right, awesome. I, I can't you. wait to read that, that memoir. It, it sounds <laughs> terrific, it really does. Same, same. Christy, you wanna tell about just going back and forth and deciding, you know, memoir, novel, novel, memoir. I can't, I can't remember the order now. <laughs> Well, it, originally it was a novel. It was my MFA thesis, my Goddard MFA thesis. And, and then I just realized it wasn't working and I didn't write for a long time. And, and then when I went back to it, I thought enough had happened that I would turn it into a memoir. And it, it took, as you know, I guess a couple of years of working on that and then finally realizing that was a really great grief therapy tool in dealing with my mom's death and dealing with my husband's death and and that that's what it needed to be and, and it didn't need to come out in that form and I just feel sorry for you that you had to read every bit of that so I, I, yeah a, after that I realized I, I want to take these themes and I want to take some of these characters and these ideas and do something with it, but I think it would lend itself better to fiction. So in that respect, I used creative nonfiction to really get to the heart of what became the novel. 
So it, it was an avenue to get to this other place, but it was absolutely crucial, I think, that it start there or that it really take root there because I really got to know um, the motifs and the themes and, and the people that I was working with. It, it, it really, that came out of the creative nonfiction, the memoir, and, and it, it, it blossomed into something else, but, but it was absolutely essential that it start there, I think. All right, thank you to everyone who sent in a question to our readers um, and our, well, our authors. There's one last question that we're gonna touch and then we'll wrap up with the Q and A. Um, and that question is to Caroline, Rachel wants to know, how did the writing of your essay impact the way you process or view this COVID era that we are living in? Um, that's a great question. I honestly, it, I, I believe that books um, kind of, if you, if you just follow your intuition, you find your way to read the right books at the right time. And that was kind of what this essay blossomed from was reading just these three very different books, different genres, totally different. And, um, but they all kind of had this sense of like, relax, take it easy. Just, you don't have to control everything. Good things can come out of a mess. Um, kind of Buddhist philosophy, right? Um, so it helped me relax a little bit and just not focus on the negative and disconnect a little bit from, or, or allow the disconnection to let me grow as a person and let my students grow at different rates, at, at different See, even that sounds like quantifying, right? But let them grow in different ways. Um, yeah, it just helped me relax a lot um, and hopefully become a better teacher working, working through that on paper. Awesome, thank you so much. Well, that brings our Q&A segment to a close. Um, so as we bring this wonderful evening to a close, I'd like to say thank you so, so much to our authors. Thank you guys for your wonderful work. Thank you, Christy, for being our special guest. And thank you viewers for tuning in and supporting NCLR. If you'd like to keep up to date on all of our events and contests, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Also, if you happen to be in the Greensboro area tomorrow, please join another staff member tomorrow night in person at Scuppernog Books. The 2021 Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize winner, Steve Mitchell, and three more of the 2021 finalists will read from their essays. This event will start at 7 p.m. And don't forget that anyone here who subscribes and or submits to NCLR over the weekend will receive a copy of the 2016 issue, which features the very first winner of the Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize. Authors who are watching, remember to submit to the 2022 Alex Albright Creative Nonfiction Prize. Once again, the deadline is March 1st. For submission information, go to our website at nclr.ecu.edu and click on submissions. Thanks again for watching. Thank you to all of our authors, to our special guests, to our editors, and to North Carolina Humanities and Melanie. And also thank you to my colleagues who helped me with this event. We wish you all health and wellness. Good night. Thank you everyone so much.